Hello, everybody. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Welcome, welcome to um, our webinar, Practical Strategies for Neuroinclusive Healthcare. So for those of you who are uh, new, new to our community, All Brains Belong is a, a toddler nonprofit, uh, we're about two years old, um, that works to make life better for people with all types of brains. And we do this by reimagining healthcare and employment and so many of the broken systems that really are not working for people with all types of brains. So tonight we're going to talk about one of one such system. Tonight's webinar is offered with support from the Organization for Autism Research, the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, Green Mountain Self-Advocates, and through the generosity of our community, including so many of you. Thank you. Before we begin, um, just some housekeeping. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on at your end if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon, but if you don't, look for the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles. And you can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you'd like to turn them off. Um, I also need to name that although we are discussing healthcare, um, tonight's webinar is for education purposes only. It is not medical or mental health advice. Tonight instead is about bridging the double empathy problem. Uh, the double empathy problem is a term that was coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK, um, that, that states that miscommunication happens when there is a mismatch of worldview and communication style. And uh, particularly in a healthcare system setting that thwarts everyone, patients and clinicians alike. Um, there is uh, a lot a lot that gets in the way of doctors and patients speaking the same language. So uh, if tonight is your first time at an All Brains Belong event, welcome. Uh, we begin everything we do with a community agreement to outline how, you know, how we're gonna be in the space together and what you can expect. So, um, all paths to participation are okay. You can have your video on or off. Um, even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those things. So feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or you know whatever else needs doing. Um, I, uh, for those of you who are returning um, to, to our Tuesday evening programming, I do need to let you know that the format of tonight is different from our regular Brain Club program. So this is a, a, a large webinar with a lot of content that will take up most of this hour. So we just ask that you please limit your chat participation to asking clarifying questions. And I'll tell you more about that in, 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 in a couple of slides from now. Um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this safe for all participants, we do focus on the community's collective access needs. And some of the ways we do that, um, uh, or, or one of the ways that we do that, um, are to usually to tread lightly around sensitive topics. However, tonight, there are a number of these. So I do want to give a content warning um, that this talk is about topics that are distressing to many people. So um, uh, terrifying health data, distress, trauma, death, suicide, systemic ableism. So please do what needs doing to take care of yourself. Take breaks, shut your sound or video, um, seek support from neurodiversity affirming support professionals. Why we're doing this webinar, you know, we understand the widespread problems with healthcare. Um, as I said before, the system thwarts everyone, patients and clinicians alike. Um, and, and we know that we have a lot of people signed on with different thoughts and different experiences of healthcare. Um, you know, we understand that, that, that really healthcare encounters have resulted in trauma for, for many people. And, and we know that, you know, within our audience tonight, we have people who play many different roles in healthcare, including um, many of our invited guests tonight who are healthcare professionals. So we have this unique opportunity that we're really excited about to be surrounded by both patients and clinicians coming to the table together. Um, and in particular, you know, that we have uh, clinicians who are open minded and eager and ready to learn. Um, so our goal tonight is to focus on getting practical information out to everyone who can use it, 
um, for clinicians to understand what they can start doing now today to adapt healthcare delivery to be more inclusive for people with all types of brains and, and strategies that patients can start using uh, to effectively get their needs met in healthcare. And um, while we acknowledge that many people tonight have experienced negative and outright traumatic healthcare experiences, and we do have other community programs where panelists share personal experiences, tonight is a webinar uh, with a bold but very limited scope. Um, it's our work tonight to model systems change to make healthcare more accessible and inclusive for people with all types of brains. Um, and uh, it's about modeling what we do here, uh, what we do, not just what we want to see, but what we're actually doing, what's actually doable. We want to model that tonight, and that's what tonight is about. Um, so um, we invite you to, to, uh, to, to participate tonight, to observe, to ask clarifying questions in the chat, to access the resources that our staff will share in the chat as we go. And of course, if you're seeking a more interactive experience, Brain Club resumes next week. Uh, so speaking of the chat, um, as always, we have staff monitoring the chat, um, and uh, we do have a different approach to the chat than at really any other program that we've ever done. Because of uh, the size of the audience um, and because of our own access needs of our staff, we ask that you limit your chat participation to asking clarifying questions so that our staff can keep up with the chat um, Last week with, a, with, with, with 200 fewer people, we had a hard time when the chat got going. So we just ask that you limit your chat participation to clarifying questions, and that'll also give space for staff to, to also be able to provide links to resources uh, relevant to the, to the things that we talk about today. Thank you. Um, and um, as our staff is posting things in the chat, the chat, for those of you who are sensitive to the chat popping and all of these things, um, we, we uh, have a couple of strategies for you if you're someone who's sensitive to the chat going fast and, and, and popping. Um, after the first pop-up, try not closing the window. Try leaving it open. And this way, new messages will replace the text, but it won't pop and you won't startle. It'll just pop once and then stay. Um, you can also try disabling chat preview where next to the little chat, bubble, there is an up carrot, you can click on that and it'll default to show chat previews with a checkbox. You can tap on that or click on that and it makes the checkbox go away and chat preview will hopefully be gone. Okay, ah. let's get started. Um, first, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a family physician. I care for toddlers through older adults. Um, mostly neurodivergent kids and adults, often multi-generational families. And though I have a bunch of professional training in, in that regard, um, what I have learned the most about brains through is parenting. Um, I'm partial to say that I'm the student of the world's wisest seven-year-old. Tonight, um, our webinar will be broken up into three segments. Part one, we're going to talk about the status quo of healthcare for neurodivergent people, which is not very good. We're going to tell you a little bit about our model here and in particular how we have co-created a healthcare model with our patient community because that is like one of one of the things that has allowed us to do what we're going to share with you today is that this is a co-created process with our community and then in our uh, part 3 uh, we're going to focus on five categories of practical strategies um, that uh, we believe will improve neurodivergent healthcare experiences outside of all brains belong. So part one, what's not working? What we know is that neurodivergent people struggle to access healthcare. This is a population that experiences exceptional health inequity. Autistic and uh, ADHD adults in particular um, uh, struggle to access healthcare, um, but that's not all. It's all of these other critical resources. What we know is that one size fits all does not work for all. At least one in five people learns things and or communicates differently than the so-called typical brain. Um, and because so many systems are deliver things in a one size fits all way, this leaves many people out. 
What we know in 2024 is that we all have different brains. We all have different ways of sensing, processing, thinking, behaving, communicating, all the things. We all have unique patterns of strengths and challenges. We all um, do things differently, which is why universal design, uh, which means offering things in multiple different ways, is best practice. And short of this, it's about focusing on designing supports and accommodations to bridge gaps in access. It's not about treating or fixing or complying with uh, neuronormative defaults. Autistic and ADHD adults have higher rates of chronic illness and untreated medical problems. 80% of autistic adults, for example, struggle to access primary care despite having a primary care practice. It's not like, oh, I got to find someone who's taking new patients. It's I have a practice and I can't access it. What's also important to note is that the literature um, and, and the patients our practice cares for uh, tell us that neurodivergent adults have high rates of negative health care experiences. They have high rates of medical trauma, and many do not feel safe accessing health care. We're going to watch a short video. David, take it away with video one. I'm terrified to go. I can just feel when I walk in, I don't know if it's a safe space for me being neurodivergent, but I also don't know if it's a safe space because of the way that I'm going to be treated and, and disregarded in terms of like, just go lose weight. Nobody believes you. Everybody looks fine. So it has to be fine. Understand everybody's access need is different. We're all different. We're not the same sort of designed for you show up and they send you places and put you in little cubbies and folders. And if you actually are like, no, nobody quite knows what to do with you. Mm -hmm. So while further descriptions of patients experiences of healthcare are outside the scope of tonight's webinar, we do invite you to access recordings from our Brain Club program that occasionally feature this topic. And so Sarah's going to drop some links in the chat of, of three, three Brain Club recordings that I highly recommend. What we know is that barriers to healthcare access for neurodivergent patients cluster into three buckets the environment, the provider, and the system. What we know is that within the environment, interactions with the environment relating to sensory process and communication, these are, these are concepts that are not part of medical education. They are not well understood. With the provider, um, uh, in a study, Darty et al. in 2020, um, a study of autistic adults perceived that healthcare providers harbored unhelpful attitudes and had insufficient knowledge and skills. And a lot of this relates to the medical problems that autistic and ADHD people commonly experience. Um, so in our medical practice, for example, 97% uh, of our autistic and ADHD adult patients suffer from a constellation of intertwined medical problems. Um, examples of this relating to the connective tissue um, uh, conditions such as hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, POTS or dysautonomia, other types of dysautonomia, mast cell dysfunction, irritable bowel, and other uh, gastrointestinal conditions, pain syndrome, sleep disorders, migraine, um, post-infectious chronic illness such as long COVID. 97%, and this is not even an inclusive list, what we know um, is that the healthcare system often gets in the way of clinicians being able to manage more than one medical problem at a time. And yet these problems are intertwined. You can't treat them separately um, because unfortunately, sometimes some of the standard management from some, for some parts of this cluster actually make the other parts worse. And so seeing these medical problems as a unified whole, which they are, um, really can result in patients getting better. And we're going to talk more about that later today. The defaults of the healthcare system get in the way of healthcare access. 
You know, you must pick up the phone to make an appointment. You must fill out the 20 page packet to become a new patient, you know, all those things. And, you know, what, what we know also is that since the end of the mask mandate, there are many patients who do not feel safe accessing healthcare and really feeling like they need to choose between health and healthcare. The medical model is also embedded with systemic ableism, which is a further barrier to healthcare access. And though um, the medical model um, of the autism narrative, for example, is gonna be outside the scope of tonight's uh, uh, webinar, we do invite you to watch the recording from a webinar we gave in April um, with the history of the autism narrative and kind of how the medical model of autism was constructed. It's eye-opening. But that's not why we're talking about this. We're talking about this because neurodivergent patients are dying. Autistic adults have a life expectancy of 36 to 54 years, with leading causes being cardiovascular disease and suicide, with autistic adults having a four to nine times increased risk of completed suicide. ADHD adults, four times increased risk of premature death, five times more likely to attempt suicide. When I learned this, this was a hard stop. I found this profoundly unacceptable. I was 37 and I had just learned that I'm autistic, ADHD, dyslexic, dyspraxic, and dyscalculic for the first time. I was also the parent of a then four-year-old multiply neurodivergent child. If I didn't know this, and no one I knew knew this, it was just a hard stop. So I decided to quit my perfectly stable job um, to start this nonprofit organization and try to do something about this so that my child could grow up in a world where neurodivergent people aren't dying in the prime of our lives. So certainly we know that the healthcare system is broken. We know it doesn't work for a lot of people, but for some people it doesn't work for, it, it can mean the difference between life and death. Has to be this way? It's just a failure of imagination. So rather than just like, we gotta keep doing the thing this way, that's how it's always been done. Like we, we really thought intentionally about what could healthcare look like? So we've intentionally created a model here at All Brains Belong where healthcare is more than medical care. We integrate medical care into social connection employment support, helping people arrive at a deep understanding of their access needs, helping the surrounding community better understand neurodiversity so that they can adapt environments and routines to help bridge gaps in access. You know, because it was plain to see, even when I worked in traditional primary care, it was plain to see that it wasn't just the healthcare system that was thwarting my neurodivergent patients. You know, people were struggling to access social relationships. They were lonely and isolated. Um, they were struggling to access their education, struggling to access employment. Healthcare is more than medical care. So the thing about this whole um, grand experiment, right, is that what we, we centered the experiences and the lived expertise of those closest to the problem. Um, as the way of addressing these huge gaps in health equity. We designed our programs first informed by the literature on, on what works and doesn't work. Um, I want to uh, highlight the work of Autistic Doctors International, um, which has, uh, we're going we're gonna to link in the chat, a list, a collection of uh, resources and uh, peer-reviewed journal articles about what has been found um, about barriers to healthcare access. Also wanna draw your attention to the Aspire Group's Healthcare Toolkit, which has a number of resources um, for patients and supporters and healthcare providers to be able to adapt to the healthcare experience. So this is where we started. And then we took it to our local community. 
um, you know, we, we, we had focus groups, we brought people together and we asked them what they needed. And this really is one of the core things we do. We ask people what they need and we try to do those things. It's that simple. So we started off even before we launched, we in, in community forums asking, you know, what does inclusion mean to you? What are the things you wish to see in the world? And then we continued to ask our community what they need. How will they know that our community has become more neuroinclusive? And um, as you can see here from a few years ago, our community advisory board felt that it was very important uh, to be educating the surrounding community around access needs. Access needs being anything that is required to meaningfully and fully participate in one's environment or community. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. It's just that, depending on how your brain works and what environments you're in, you may be more or less likely to have your access needs met by the defaults of society. And there's all different types of access needs, and they're all relevant to healthcare access. So, you know, we are looking at health as the health of a community as the whole. We're holding space for our patients, for our community members that we're serving uh, to be able to communicate their needs. We ask the people what they want. We try to do that. We ask them what stresses them out and we try not to do that. Really, that is what has allowed us to do anything that you're about to hear that we do. Really, this is um, a group of people, you know, children, adults, families, uh, whose needs have not been met by the traditional systems, the healthcare system and, and, and the other systems. Um, most of our community members are folks who have, have been invalidated, dismissed, um, misunderstood. They come here and they connect with other people navigating similar journeys. And uh, they come together as a community health village. And really together with our circle of supporters, we built this community health village of learning and healing together where people can show up as their true selves amongst other people who get it. Um, and, and in so doing, they transform their lives. They transform their self narratives, but they shift their own lens of how they see themselves um, through connecting with other people. And they build trust in other people, trust in a community, and are reimagining their own lives because now they know what's possible. So um, uh, we're going to play a short video. I uh, to be able to hear from some of our community members. David, take it away with video two. An opportunity to meet others in the community who are going through the same or similar things, um, which then gives you know, us the opportunity to learn from each other's experiences and to really value and feel valued by each other and feel a lot less alone and a lot more hopeful um, and so it ends up feeling like a community more than a medical practice. What I often see is once people feel safe and once people have been cued safety, they're able to engage in community. And that's when we really see these kind of healthcare jumps for people. Um, we see, you know, people come to group visits and learn from other people and have that shame reduction of, oh, it's not just me dealing with all these things. Um, there's other people who believe me, there's other people who are like me, um, and get really quality medical care too. To be in a community where I get to explore and learn about my brain and other people and other people's brains. We're all in this together as individuals that, you know, that sees things differently, hears things differently, moves things differently. Smoothing out the rough edges of my experiences and of my perceptions. I'm less harsh on myself. I'm less sharp with myself. Right? It's exposing me to people being so beautifully raw and authentic because the space allows that. And I can't think of many spaces in life that allow for people to 
um, to come together in this way and kind of like this radical act of trust. ABB to me has been a way to have community, have social connections, to understand my body, to reframe mental illness into, you know, autism, to, to medicines that, you know, simple medicines that have been able to make my mobility and my um, ability to be in the world different. ABB has given me a way to be myself and in community with others um, that I hadn't had in so long. What do you mean healthcare can be like this? So as the model evolves, um, it's important, we, we believe it's really important to keep asking our patient community what they need. And thanks to the Organization for Autism Research and the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, um, we were able to compensate our patients for sharing their lived expertise. Um, so um, when uh, the, the, the what I'm about to share with you next came from input from our patients. So um, uh, what, what, what not only does breaking the cycle of extraction that is so commonly perpetuated by so many systems, it, it actually results in co-creating this, this model that's actually making, that is actually meeting people's needs. So um, in addition to learning what we can do better, uh, we learned what our patients identified as best practices. So what I'm about to share with you, it's not everything that we do, but we wanted to share ideas for what clinicians can do to adapt healthcare delivery in traditional healthcare settings and things that patients who get healthcare, you know, in, in a range of traditional health settings who could actually, you know, maybe think about would be helpful for them and maybe some things they can ask for. Because what we know is that patients don't usually know what they're, quote, allowed to ask for, um, you know, and that's where universal design comes in, um, you know, which, which is the idea of offering things in multiple different ways. And like one of our community members shared a few years ago, I don't know what my access needs are. I just know they're not being met. Yes. That's exactly where universal design comes in. So you don't need to know what your access needs are yet. You get started by having a menu, something to choose from. So uh, David, go for video three. I get to see people come in who haven't been able to get care anywhere else. Do you want bright lights, low lights, fidget toys? Um, do you want to have time check-ins? Do you want to have summaries sent? These things are in what what interests me about all brains belong is the idea of a customizable menu to make an experience whether it's a vaccine clinic or a medical visit in the office or a community gathering event feel good to each unique individual being able to cue safety and adapt the environment for what people need and What do you mean healthcare can be like this? So one size fits all does not work for all. I've said that a couple of times already. Um, you know, anytime we put the onus on the person with a disability to come up with their own accommodations, that's ableism. And so this 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 also is not about a set of like things you do necessarily differently or like special things to do for the special people. This is about offering things in multiple different ways. So at All Brains Belong, um, all of our patients are offered a menu um, where they have a choice of their setting, the way they schedule, the way they communicate during and between appointments, the way that a range of different types of supports for executive functioning, um, adaptation to the environment, supports for sensory processing, everybody. Because um, not everybody is neurodivergent. Not everybody is even thinking about their brains or any of these things at all. It's just they come because their healthcare needs were not met by other settings and they're offered a menu. And so 
um, uh, this menu that is just part of, of everybody's onboarding experience. Um, and what we're going to talk about now are some strategies, parts of our menu um, that our patients have identified as best practices for neuroinclusive healthcare. Here we go. So strategy number one, adapt the environment. So a, a, a lot of our patients um, have had really negative healthcare experiences, a lot of medical trauma. So when they walk into an environment that reminds them of other places where traumatic things have happened, um, their limbic system sounds the alarm and that interferes with them being able to access their executive functioning, access their communication, access healthcare. Um, so um, we very intentionally design our environment to not look and feel like a healthcare facility. Um, so this is this is what our waiting room looks like. Um, there's usually not more than one patient who comes in at a time. That may not be practical in a traditional setting. So let's talk about what you can do anywhere. So um, adaptations like setting, um, you know, uh, healthcare outdoors, um, at your car, telemedicine, of course. Um, uh, this is this is this is something I did even in traditional primary care. Certainly, there may be some you know trade offs. And so, if uh, I if 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 the system makes me see patients every ten minutes, uh, which you know. That's what some systems are like. If the system makes people do that, um, the amount of time required to walk out of the building and outside and find a place that's not in sunlight and under a tree or something, that's going to take away from the 10 minutes. And so that is a truth. And you still might be able to ask for different kinds of settings if you're a patient. And if you're a clinician and you, could, and, and you know that your patients are, are stressed out by the fluorescent lights, can you dim the lights? Can you ask people? You know, some people like the lights on, some people like the lights off. Let me know. Is there anything we can do to furniture to be more comfortable? Is there anything we can do for temperature? How about background music? Even in a traditional primary care setting, I would routinely ask my patients if they wanted, you know, something playing in the background, especially, you know, during a procedure or something like that. Um, these are, you know, these, this, 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 this kind of thinking, it's a, it's a lens. It's not necessarily like something extra you buy or something extra you do. Um, many patients, um, you know, if the, are, are, are claustrophobic and really feel, um, very, very uncomfortable when the exam room door is closed, or particularly when somebody's waiting, people to offer, you know, hey, do you want the door closed or left or open? And again, if privacy can be maintained, if not, that's different. But depending on what your setting is, that really may be something that cues safety to a lot of people. Of course, um, uh, grounding tools, focus tools, some people call these fidgets, normalize their use. We have them all over, you know, in the exam room, in the waiting room. Um, you know, we'll routinely pick one up, just normalizing. This is, this is something that, you know, people with all types of brains often find helpful. Strategy number two, normalize that there's no one right way to communicate. You know, normalizing with a comment like, you know, lots of people communicate in lots of different ways. You know, we have some paper here. You know, we have some, you know, uh, some people text or they type. Or by the way, you're also welcome to send me information ahead of time. I could even share my questions ahead of time to give you time to think. Normalize that um, people do things in lots of different ways. Um, the thing I want to just highlight is that there's there's an extensive literature base that um, many neurodivergent people struggle specifically with using the telephone, um, and that that is a specific barrier to healthcare access. So we then have to maybe think if we're in a traditional system, you know, how else can we allow and afford access? Because if we're limiting it to the phone. That's not going to work. And then some settings will say, well, we have the patient portal, you know, the one with the password that no one can remember. So we have to, again, figure out how to negotiate all of these different um, these different types of access needs. And again, figuring out how people communicate by normalizing that people communicate in a range of different ways. 
you know, we have people that even in person, they they come in and they send us text messages. They sit in the room and they text, they send a text message because that's how they best communicate. Why would I not want everyone to be able to communicate in the way that works best for them? We have um, uh, 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 lots of folks who they schedule in lots of different ways. Um, we have self-scheduling through our website. People can email, they can, they can send text messages. They, they can request refills of medicines through that same way. Different ways of organizing information ahead of time. Um, we do a lot of pre-visit planning where we let folks know what we want to, you know, that we, what we are trying to um, learn about them in advance and they can communicate in any number of ways um, how, how that works. We also spend a lot of time during appointments helping people prepare scripts, like things that they are going to say when they have to access healthcare outside of All Brains Belong. For example, um, if they have to see a specialist, et cetera. Um, because that, it can be really hard to like come up with the ideas and perspective take and order and like put the things in order while you're in a setting that doesn't work for you. You may not have access to that. So doing the the planning ahead of time of, 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 of uh, how you're going to present information or organize information to get your needs met. During appointments, um, as I said, normalizing multimodal communication um, we have folks who not only, you know, are, are sending tech messages in the office, they might be writing things, um, you know, handwritten things ahead of time or during the office. Um, they might draw ahead of time or in the office, we have a lot of drawing materials out on the table and we just normalize. Yeah, some people, you know, they, that's why it's here. Um, because there is no one right way to communicate. Strategy number three, supporting executive functioning. You know, I think that um, shared decision making um, and the idea of coming up with like a shared agenda for an appointment, that really was taught, like it was taught pretty well in medical education, at least for me. Um, what was not necessarily modeled was the idea of a visual support for that shared agenda. So writing it out, like how we're gonna spend our time together. Um, sketch it out, or even just on a piece of paper. And so if I'm a patient in the appointment, I might like start making that myself. Okay, so how much time do we have today together? Okay, so um, how, are we, how are we gonna use that time? These are the topics that I would, would like to address. Um, you know, I think that because lots of people with lots of types of brains may not experience time in a linear way, um, it can be really important to uh, support folks in knowing how the passing of time is happening. So, you know, we have 30 minutes together or we have 15 minutes together. Let's make a list of topics so we can prioritize how to use that time together. Um, if we don't get through the list, we'll return to other topics at your next appointment. And then as time goes by, you know, OK, well, we have 10 minutes left. We have five minutes left. And asking people, you know, some people want some people want to be cute as time's going by. You know, is that a thing? Let me know if that'd be a thing that'd be helpful for you. Some people like they don't want that at all. And that's fine. It's just offering. It's offering things in case it's helpful. And normalizing that lots of people find it helpful. Lots of people don't. Having concrete action steps sent in the method of the patient's choice. I think sometimes in a lot of different healthcare settings, the default is that they get sent their after visit summary through the patient portal that they can't actually log into to access. Now they've got nothing about what the concrete action steps are. So what is the best way for you to take away information from, from this appointment? And then of course, like all the nonsense to navigate the rest of the healthcare system. It's so hard. It's so hard, you know, like making phone calls, doing research, you know, somebody like I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to be in this place and I need to try to find a physical therapist who has this kind of expertise located in this place that we don't live in. Um, so fine, we can, we can do that work of, of, of exploring resources together during appointments. It's not extra, it's part of healthcare. Creating visual supports, you know, um, the other day uh, I was I was I was uh, talking with a patient about a different way they'd be preparing their their medication. And we like created a visual support for how how this was going to look. And we did it during the appointment, because, again, if it's like required for healthcare access. And I think that um, uh, one 
one great brain club that I really would recommend and, 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 um, Sarah, this is not in my list. Um, so if you can find it, great. Otherwise, Okay. uh, we'll, we can send it at the end. It's, it's from March, 2024. It's that panel we did with the, um, the primary care physicians who work in traditional primary care. Um, one of, one of the panelists, Dr. Bujold, she shared that she does this stuff during appointments, um, because otherwise she was finding that her patients weren't able to access the things. So again, it's just doing it during appointments. Yeah, exactly, Eden. And how about executive functioning support between appointments? You know, what we know is that um, executive functioning is hard. Um, I, 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 I wrote a blog post about this yesterday, actually. Um, just there's so much and it's taken for granted. So let's let's even say that someone was able to schedule an appointment and we just talked about all the ways, all, all of the reasons why that may not have happened, may not have been able to happen, you know, must pick up the phone, must log into the portal, all this. But let's say, let's say I've scheduled an appointment, I may not actually be able to go um, because actually to get there requires an exceptional amount of executive functioning. And as uh, uh, particularly in the setting of chronic illness with fluctuating capacity, someone just really may not be able to get there. And I think that in when I worked in traditional primary care, there was often this narrative of when a patient misses an appointment, there was judgment about that. There really was in a lot of different settings that I've been in. And really, it's like, well, they, it's not that they don't that people don't care about coming to their appointment um, or they don't care about their health. It, it's that this is actually part of somebody's disability. So part of actually being able to access healthcare is to remind people about their appointments. And that may need to take place by email, that may need to take place by text message. Um, and normalizing that like lots of people need reminders because lots of people do. In fact, most of our practice does. Uh, I do, if I don't get a reminder, like sometimes I miss appointments, it's how it goes. Also, um, the idea that someone would know when they need to come for healthcare um, is not to be taken for granted at all. So part of neuroinclusive healthcare, we believe, is to actually have a system to recall patients to say, you know, hey, um, at the last appointment, we, you know, we did this and we said we'd check in in two months. It's been two months. I'd like to get, I'd like to offer you an appointment, right? So, so again, um, uh, prompting folks from an executive functioning standpoint, like, you know, yeah, it, this is, this, this is the time where we had intended would be a time to make sure that things are going safely for you. In addition to whenever else you're going to act, request to access healthcare. I mentioned pre-visit planning um, uh, uh, on a previous slide about giving folks the opportunity to, um, to, to either you know, write or draw or email or fill out a form or talk with um, you know, a member of the staff ahead of time to about what the priorities are and actually having a copy of that as a visual support. Here are the things that you shared or at least having that be an option can be very helpful. Strategy number four, tools to support all the things. So I mentioned the constellation of intertwined medical problems that 97% of our autistic and ADHD adults experience um, with the support from the Organization for Autism Research and the Autism Intervention Research on Physical Health. Um, all Brains Belong created a resource, released a resource last summer um, that really is a, um, uh, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? the culmination of a year and a half of work with our community. It was really a co-created educational resource, co-created with more than a hundred of our autistic and ADHD community members. And what this resource is, the Everything's Connected to Everything, Improving the Healthcare of Autistic and ADHD Adults resource, what it is, is it's patient education materials, and as well as resources for primary care clinicians who are in the trenches or the healthcare system is saying, like, you, you, you got to do all the things in 10, 15 minutes, which is, you know, thwarting, thwarting everybody, as I said before. So um, part of this resource is a set of clinician guides or clinician resources, including a 16 page comprehensive management guide 
um, that has it's 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 well researched. It has all these different links to peer reviewed journal articles. The guide itself was peer reviewed by twenty primary care physicians who practice in traditional primary care settings. Um, you know, it's it's but but I think I think one of the tools that 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 um, I'm most proud of is this. Part of the, um, the, the, the resource set for patients is this letter. This letter, it's short. It's like three and a half paragraphs. It's written to primary care clinicians with language that they are used to receiving information in with the idea that a patient can print this out, bring it to their next primary care appointment, hand your clinician the letter. Let the clinician do, I mean, let the letter do the work for you. Um, we've gotten feedback from um, patients who don't get their health care here and from um, clinicians who someone has given the letter to. That it works really, it, that, that this, this really has been an effective way to introduce the resource set. So you don't have to say a whole lot of other things. In fact, it works better when you don't. Hand the letter, not a whole bunch of other things from the resource set, just the letter. Here's this letter, I'd like you to read it. Um, and that's going to introduce the project um, in a way that um, will allow for um, uh, patients and their primary care clinicians to work through these complex medical problems together. And lastly, strategy number five, COVID considerations. So what we know is that neurodivergent people are at increased risk of complications from COVID, including long COVID. We know that people with hypermobility are also at increased risk of long COVID. We know that neurodivergent people are more likely to be hypermobile and hypermobile people are more likely to be neurodivergent. This is an at-risk group. We know that the more times you get COVID, the higher your risk of long COVID. The only way to not get long COVID is to not get COVID. Feedback from our patients is that this is critically important to them. Um, here are some quotes. I haven't gotten health care in a long time because I don't want to get COVID from an unmasked doctor or the waiting room. What a heartbreaking thing for someone to have to choose. You're the only practice I've found in Vermont that is COVID and long COVID formed. And at All Brains Belong, I don't have to choose between getting health care and my health. This is not hard. Because good news, we know how to reduce the risk of COVID transmission in healthcare. Um, we know about well-fitting, appropriate masks, K95 and N95 masks. We know about air filtration with um, high-grade air purifiers. Patients can ask for the first appointment of the day. Maybe you might be in a setting where you can request an outdoor appointment. And, um, you know, I know folks are joining us from, from all, all different places across the country. Um, we encourage folks to consult their local disability advocacy organizations for support around requesting formal um, accommodations under the Americans with Disability Act. So in Vermont, um, huge shout out to the Vermont Center for Independent Living, um, who is just an incredible gem, an incredible resource for our community. Okay, so um, uh, wrapping up, um, actually, I'm gonna, I just noticed a question in the chat. Um, thanks, Heather, for the question. How would you find something similar in other states? Um, uh, depending on where someone lives, I mean, I, I might just, uh, this might be a Google search of like disability advocacy organizations. There might be something like a, um, you know, disability rights in the name of your state. That might be a good starting point. I know a lot of, a lot of disability advocacy organizations have names that go like that, like Disability Rights Vermont, Disability Rights Maine. Um, so that might be a search, um, but it might it, it might be about, um, uh, you know, experimenting with different types of search terms in the, the geographic um, region that somebody lives in. Thanks for the question. Okay, so um, wrapping up, I want to share some other resources. 
Um, so the first resource I want to share um, is the Inclusive Healthcare Partnership Project um, from the Vermont um, uh, Dis Developmental Disabilities Council. So this is a, a set of healthcare information written in plain language and delivered with universal design principles. There are graphics, there are videos, um, and the, the whole set of projects is co-created um, between a team of healthcare providers and community members with intellectual disability. Um, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network has a robust collection of resources, including a healthcare transition toolkit and a library of self-advocacy resources. Mountain Self-Advocate um, also has a robust collection of self-advocacy resources. And I think one resource in particular that I want to draw your attention to um, for, 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 for everybody, patients and clinicians, um, are a set of plain language resources. Plain language um, benefits everyone. Plain language is clear language. Um, and uh, I, I am still really working on my ability to communicate with plain language. The Organization for Autism Research has a set of health resources, a whole collection of patients for all ages. We'll link that in the chat as well. And then lastly, um, Autistic Space is a framework that was released last year by researchers from Autistic Doctors International. Um, uh, it's a framework for clinicians to be able to meet the sensory predictability and communication needs for autistic patients. This is a, a, a good read. Sarah's going to link that in the chat too. And then um, on, on, on top of that, All Brains Belong does offer trainings uh, for healthcare practices, for employers, uh, for a range of organizations looking to enhance uh, you know, their understanding of neurodiversity and how to create spaces where people with all types of brains can get their needs met and thrive. So um, in, in conclusion, um, neurodivergent patients experience disproportionately poor healthcare outcomes. And um, what I hope that you've taken away um, uh, from tonight is that there are simple, inexpensive adaptations to healthcare delivery that can expand access to healthcare. Um, and that addressing unmet social, educational, and employment needs are also an important part of supporting neurodivergent patients' health. And uh, this, 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 of course, is um, all about relationships. And so if there's, um, whether, whether, whether you're beginning a relationship with All Brains Belong tonight um, or, or deepening or continuing your relationship with us, um, you know, if, there, if you heard something that resonated with you tonight, we just invite you to get connected and you can sign up for our newsletter. You can, um, at this website, um, allbrainsbelong.org forward slash get dash connected. Um, there's links to programs, um, our community education programs, um, our, uh, you know, a, a link to sign up for the newsletter. You can follow us on social media where we post a lot about, you know, this, um, these types of topics in addition to um, workplace uh, neuroinclusion strategies. So um, we, we uh, welcome you, welcome you to get connected. And I'm going to scroll up and uh, going through questions, any questions that haven't been answered. It's like looks like looks like our team here has been been busy. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we probably have time to take a couple of questions. Um, you can if you've got questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, there's a question about online support groups. Um, we, 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 we do have a range of patient only um, uh, programs, but um, we don't we don't offer any uh, public support groups that are open to the general public. Um, we do have a weekly community education program called Brain Club. Um, it meets every Tuesday at six. In fact, that's what usually happens tonight at six. Um, uh, so, so it's, it's not a support group, but it is a community education program where we have guest speakers and community panelists. Um, and, uh, many, many people do experience a sense of connection from, from Brain Club. 
we'd invite you invite you to check it out. Um, and Michelle, absolutely, there will be a recording of this available. Um, it will be um, uh, shared next week. So it'll go out by email to everyone who's registered. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Thank you so much for being here and uh, joining us tonight. And uh, we hope to see you again at a future All Brains Belong program. Have a good night.